Well, you got a, all right, amen, amen, good, good. Open to Exodus 17. There you go, Exodus 17, wait a minute, I thought we were talking about Ephesians. We are, we're going to. Um, listen, I, I want to start off today by saying this right up front, a disclaimer, okay? Uh, I'm not referencing anybody. I don't have anybody in mind. None of that. This morning, just let me be a pastor who is teaching some scripture. And let it be what it is. Is that fair? Are we cool with that? Because I'm being honest when I say, when I was preparing for this message, there was n I had no ill will or thoughts of anybody in the process of it. I was thinking about it this morning. I was going through my notes. I'm like, man, I better make that disclaimer because someone's going to think that I had... Uh, ill will or something towards uh, maybe a previous member of the church or whatnot. I'm just being frank, because I can be frank. I, uh, I'm not. I'm just trying to be a pastor. I'm trying to teach some scripture. I'm trying uh, to help us learn something. Because I think what we're going to talk about this, mo this morning, in my humble opinion, may be one of the most important things in these last days to understand. Especially if we're going to talk about, uh, and obviously, uh, you know, what I mean by that is after salvation, okay? As Christians, all right? So, so now watch, Exodus 17, verse number one. And all the, read that with me. Okay, you see that? See that word congregation? That word congregation, okay? It's the, it, it's the same root that's going to lead to the word ecclesia, which is what? The assembly, which is the, okay. Now, obviously, we are, we are looking at an Old Testament passage written to the, okay? So, so does this apply directly to us from a doctrinal standpoint? Obviously not. However, all scripture is written for our learning. Yeah, amen. Okay, we give it out. And, and on top of that, I would say scripture is a picture, a similitude. Okay, so, so never read something and go, well, that's not doctrinally relevant for me, so I don't have to worry about it. No, you do. Look at the pictures in it. That is relevant. Okay, so in all the congregation of the, y'all see that word right there? Okay, of Israel, journey from the wilderness of sin, after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord, and pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore, the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide you with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt? Egypt is a picture of the... Okay? To kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee the elders of Israel, and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thy hand, and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massah or Meribiah because the, children of the, uh, because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? So get the picture. Okay, you've got this congregation of children. They're murmuring, okay, to the leader, the, the leader of, of uh, who God called to lead them to where? Okay, which is not heaven. It's where, that's where it's at. That's where the place of milk and honey is, man. That's where we're going to be what we were called to be at that place. And Moses was called to bring them there. And that was their, their uh, place to be so that they can now be full functioning Israelites. I'll get the picture. Full functioning Christians. Okay, this isn't, this isn't a, a passage of, uh, uh, you know, the, the leading to pr the promised land isn't how you get to heaven. Crossing the river Jordan isn't entering into heaven. That's, that's, that's not right. Crossing the river Jordan is entering into the place of where, where you can be fruitful, where you've now grown out of infancy 
and grown up into adulthood. Now you're a full functioning member of, uh, in this case, of the nation of Israel. Uh, in our case, uh, a full functioning member of the body of Christ. Okay, so what, what, you had a bunch of, you had a bunch of people chiding with the leader, going, oh, wow, you brought us out of the world to bring us here, and now we got no water, like, you fool, why would you do this to us? What are you doing? Well, because God told me to do this, okay, that's why, okay, and, and God said, well, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go up to that rock right there, take this stick right here, and I want you to, what? Strike it. Got it? Okay. We look at that story, we go, all right, Interesting. Now go to Numbers 20. Numbers chapter 20. Because you think these guys would have learned from the mistakes. And of course, they didn't. They didn't learn from the mistake. Now watch. Numbers 20. Now, now, now watch how God does this again. Then came the children of Israel, even the whole... See that? Okay. God's pointing to the congregation and the children of Israel again, right? And it says, even the whole congregation in the desert of Zin in the first month, and the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. And there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people chilled with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord? And why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord unto this wilderness, that we had our cat?" The same idea, right? Well, hey, why'd you bring us out of Egypt to bring us? Like, like, hey, hello, this already happened. Didn't you get it the first time? Like, why are we doing this again? You're murmuring again on the same thing. And Moses and Aaron whoa, uh, went from the presence of the assembly under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. They fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. The Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and strike ye on... And strike, what does that say right there? Okay, now hold on a minute. The first time, he told them, he told Moses, take the stick, the rod, and strike the rock. The second time, he says, speak to the rock, right? And it shall bring forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts to drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Here now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock. I mean, could you imagine? Could you imagine if I sat up here and go, Here now, ye rebels. You know, we can't do that today because we're, we're too thick, uh, thin skinned for stuff like that. But, you know, back in the day, uh, apparently, uh, God was okay at uh, uh, the leader talking to the people when they were. Uh, doing things they weren't supposed to be doing like that, but you know, we're not there anymore. And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod, he spoke to the rock twice. Uh, no, what did he do? He smoked the rock twice, and the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and the beast also. All right, but here's the problem, okay? Did Moses do what God told him to do? Okay. And we look at that and we go, well, okay, come on. <laughs> you know, he did everything else. Give the guy a break. Not a that big of a deal. No, 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 no tough thing here. Cer certainly, God in his grace uh, forgave him for this, right? Is that what happened? Uh, no. It was because of this instance right here that Moses was not allowed into the promised land. Okay? And the question that we look at that and we go, man, that's just mean, God. Why would you do that? Well, I mean, come on, man. Look at everything else Moses did. Like, you know, he, 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 I mean, why would you do that, God? Well, let me tell you why. Because what was going on here is God was setting up a picture. And he was trying to teach not only this generation, but all generations a lesson. In Hosea 12.10, I would keep, your, keep yourself in Deuteronomy 32. We're going to come right back to that in a second. But in Hosea 12.10, if you'd like to turn there with me, we have no PowerPoint this morning, by the way. We're going to turn our Bibles this morning. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, good. I'm glad somebody's okay with that. Look at Hosea 12.10 and look what it says. It says there, I have also spoken by the prophets 
And I have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. Now go to Deuteronomy 32 and let me just talk to you about that verse while you're heading back there. What God is selling us is that the way he teaches us through his word, one of his uh, uh, go-tos, if I can say it that way, is to teach us through pictures. Okay? Got it? So now, let, now that we know that that's how God teaches us, and we looked at this story of what, what Moses uh, did, this was a, there was a picture going on. I'll explain that picture to you in a second. But I want you to see what the result of this picture was. Look at starting in Deuteronomy 32. I'm going to skip around a little bit for the sake of time and just talk a couple, about a couple of verses here. Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Well, that sounds pretty big right there. Like, God speaking. <laughs> it says, give ear, heavens, I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Wow, I think that one might, might want to say, hey, we better listen to what he's about to say right here because I think God's got something to say. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb and as the showers upon the grass. Because I will publish the name of the Lord. Ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the... Oh boy. His work is Perfect. For all his ways are judgment. What? All his ways are judgment? Wait a minute. What is he saying there? A God of truth, without iniquity, just and right is he. They have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. They are perverse and a crooked generation. Do ye thus requite the Lord? Or oh, foolish people and unwise? Is not he the father that hath brought thee, that hath made, not made thee, and established thee? Drop down to verse 15. But Jeshua, run waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick. He's talking about how Israel uh, uh, didn't follow after the commandments of God, didn't follow after the chosen leader Moses. And he says, uh, they forsook God, which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations, provoking them him to anger. Who? who? God. Whoa. They sacrificed to the devils, not to God. To gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up whom your fathers fear not, of the rock that begot thee. Thou art unmindful and is forgotten God that formed thee. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them. Wow. Because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. Wow. I will see what their end shall be. For they are very forward generation. Children in whom is no faith. Well, thankfully, he was talking about them, and he ain't talking about us. Oh, no, we're Laodicea. He is talking about us. Okay, and Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? We're in that generation, my friends. Okay, so yes, you're right. He is talking to Israel there, but do not miss. He's talking to us too. He's talking to us too, and don't think he's a different God. He may have a different dispensation and the way he, he, he uh, 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 conducts himself in each generation may be different and dispensation, but he's the same God, okay? And the things that, can I just say it like this? The things that ticked off God then, ticks off God now too. He hasn't changed it. Matter of fact, I might suggest it might tick him off even more because now Jesus, his son, has died on the cross. There's no reason for it. Look at uh, with me in verse 28. For they are a nation void of counsel. And by the way, we are a chosen nation, a royal priesthood. Look, they are a nation that are void of counsel. Neither is there any understanding in them. Hmm, I think we've talked about a little bit about that in Proverbs. Sam Robert, those three, yep, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. They have none. They're void of it. Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider 
their latter end. And they didn't. And they didn't. Look at verse 36. For the Lord shall judge his people. Is he going to judge us? Yes, he is. And repent himself for his servants when he seeth that their power is gone and there is none shut up or left. Look at verse 44. And Moses came and spake all the words of this song in the ears of the people. He and... Y'all see who that is? Do you know who Hosea is? The son of Nun? That's Joshua. Do you know who Joshua is a picture of in the Bible? Joshua is the name of Jesus in the Old Testament. Okay? And so it's almost like God's got, like, pointing all this stuff out in us. He's throwing in these little words. Congregation. Children. Jesus. He's just throwing this stuff out there. And he's letting us know all these things. And then look what happens in verse 48. And the Lord spoke unto Moses that selfsame day, saying, Get thee up into this mountain, Abarim, Abarim, yep, unto Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, that is over against Jericho, and behold the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel for possession. Look at it, Moses. Get up in this mountain. Take a look across the river Jordan. Look at the land that I gave you. And Moses is up there. Just picture it. And he's looking at it, and he's going, Ah, oh, finally! Look at that! Hold on a minute. And die in the mount, whither thou goest up. And be gathered unto the people, as Aaron thy brother died in the mount, whore, and was gathered unto his people. Why? Because ye trespass against me among the children of Israel. You trespass against me? What the heck did Moses do? Where? In Meribiah Kadesh, in the wilderness of Zin. And what happened over there in Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin? He struck the rock when he was supposed to speak to it. Yet thou shalt see the land before thee, but thou shalt nether, shall not, uh, shall not go thither under the land which I have given the children of Israel. Whew. Folks, what I'm trying to explain to you is God takes similitudes very seriously. They're not just jokes. It's not just something that I'll get around to if I feel like it. No. God takes his similitudes very carefully, uh, seriously. And you go, okay, well, why? Okay, so good. Why'd you tell us all that? Because do you understand what Ephesians 5 is doing? It might be one of the greatest similitudes of the church in the Bible. So let's go now with me, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 5. I believe uh, Pastor Robert ended on verse number 29 uh, last week, correct? So I'm going to pick up in verse 30. It says, For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. And you can close your Bibles. We can have a good day. Amen. Now, listen. The, don't miss the point of this passage. Okay? Starting back in verse number 22, all the way to the end of this passage, don't miss the point. All right? Let me say this. This might be one of the most talked about things by Paul in all the church epistles. The relationship of the church to the body of Christ. I don't know if it's the most, but I'm going to tell you, he spends a lot of time talking about it in a lot of the books. Okay? So, so Colossians 3 comes to mind right now. Like, I think the whole chapter is really all about, if you compare this chapter with Colossians 3, like, you're going to see a lot of similarities. Okay? The point that I'm trying to make is, if God continuously talks about something, <laughs> I don't know that we can sit here and go, well, that's important, that's less important. I don't know. I would say, personally, that if it's in the book, it's important. That's what I would say. 
But I would, but I definitely would say this. If God continuously talks about it, it's probably important, really important. This is really important. It's really important. Romans 12, 5 says, So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. And what he's doing now, he's giving us a absolutely critical similitude. And that similitude is marriage. And don't get this backwards because Jesus was prepared before the foundation of the earth to die on the cross. Okay, So don't think that marriage trumps Christ in the church. No. Marriage was instituted to be a picture of Christ in the church before marriage was ever even instituted. See, we got it. We got to get on board with God now, and we got to start thinking like God would think in this area. It's not husband and wife. Oh, look at that. Cool. We represent Christ in the church now that he's died on the cross. No, marriage was instituted from the very get-go to represent Christ in the church because it was prepared before the foundations of the earth that he was going to do so. He was going to be the Lamb of God. Y'all understand? So the whole reason why God even created marriage in the first place is to be a similitude of Christ in the church. I want you to understand how serious that is. This institution of the church is not just a, eh, like we treat it today. This is a big deal. And all I can say is, when Moses went and he struck the rock the first time, who is the rock? Okay, y'all get this, right? If Jesus is the rock, the first time he came, did he get struck? Yes, he did. See, there's the picture. But then Moses said, okay, the second time, he said, speak to the rock. Why? Because the second time Jesus comes, is he coming to, be, to, to get struck? Is anybody going to strike him the second time? No. But what is coming out of his mouth? See, God was trying to teach them about the, comings, the, the two comings of the rock. In other words, what he was saying, now get this, stop your freaking murmuring, you idiots. Stop it. What are you murmuring about? He is the living water. And Moses just did something. I don't know what his issue was. What I will say is that in those, those verses, and I don't got time to go through them all and, and really dig this out, but I think if you did, you would, you would see it. I see three major things that took place in there. Anger took place in there. Uh, murmuring certainly took place in there. And disobedience took place in there. And I would say those are probably three of the biggest problems in churches today. People getting mad at one another, getting angry at one another, getting mad at the pastor, getting mad at what? Okay, murmuring, okay, and disobedience. Those were all the problems that were going on in those two stories that led to even the great Moses to get mad and angry at the people to the point where he's like, these stupid people, and he took the, the stick and he struck it when he shouldn't have done it. And we look at that and we go, man, okay, well, he made a simple mistake. Come on, not that big of a deal. No, it was a big deal. He wasn't allowed into the promised land. It was a very big deal. So my question would then be is, as we look at the church, do you think God, who's giving us this great mystery of how a husband and wife relationship represents the church, of uh, uh, the body of Christ, the, the, the head being Christ, and his church, do you think that when he's giving us this similitude, that he's just like, eh, you know, no biggie. Do it if you feel like it. If you don't, don't. Don't worry about it. We'll, we'll, we'll set all that straight later at the judgment. Oh, he's going to. He's going to set it, set it straight at the judgment. And we're going to find out. We treated this church thing oh, not even close to the way it should have been treated. And we weren't functioning members in the church like we should have been. And listen, I, I'm just telling you guys, this is a big deal. A very big deal. Look, 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 just look at how it's, look, look at verse 31. For this cause, what cause? 
if you're going to read a bi- the Bible, right, and you're going to try to uh, understand uh, 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 what it's saying, we've got to put it in context, number one, of course. But then number two, like, read every word. What cause is he talking about? Right? What is the cause? The cause is us being members of the body of Christ. Well, what is being a member of the body of Christ mean? What is the, what is, it's the flesh and the bones and you're members of it. Well, let me tell you what the cause is. We need to understand. We need to grab onto what is the purpose of marriage. If I'm going to know what the cause is, I need to know what the effect is, right? What is the purpose of marriage? See, in America today, we don't understand truthfully what the purpose of marriage is. We think marriage has to do with my happiness, my joy. She is going to give me what I want out of this relationship. Let me just give you a big news flash. That's not biblical marriage, my friends. Never was, never will be. I know here in America, that's what we've turned marriage into, and that's how we view marriage. But I'm telling you right now, if you are to read your Bible and to understand what a biblical marriage is, you won't even see that even remotely referenced in the Bible. To even, I don't even know how we got to that, outside of the fact that the people just don't know their Bibles anymore. No. No, that is not the purpose of marriage. And by the way, just so that we don't miss the point, he brings us back to it. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and those should be joined unto his wife, and there should be one flesh. Where did that where was that mentioned? What he's quoting a verse right there. What's he quoting? Genesis chapter 2. He's bringing us back to the very when God implemented marriage so you don't miss the point. And he's saying, what is the purpose of marriage? Right? Genesis 2, 23-24 says, And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Uh, She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh almost like you're being born again i'm just saying you're leaving the old house to formulate a new house whoa that sounds like bible stuff right there because you're no longer in that kingdom you're now in the kingdom of huh i got verses folks okay i got stuff i can bring it to you right now we could we could dig this out absolutely is what this is it's a great picture and what was it why was it why was it that god created eve to make adam happy to give him joy to be a sexual object well why did god create eve that's very very critical for us to understand and most people don't understand it God created Eve because God had a mission for Adam. And he couldn't do the mission. It was the whole purpose for Adam's existence. He was to replenish the earth with sons of God. But the problem is, how is Adam going to replenish the earth? Because Adam don't have the right stuff up in there to do it. He needs somebody else to do it. And so God looked at Adam and said this ain't good. Almost like God got, you know, surprised by this. No, God's like, this ain't good. So here, this is what I'm going to do, okay? I'm going to get pull a woman out of you, okay, Adam, and she is going to cleave to you, and you're going to become one. Just like when Jesus comes, the same thing's going to happen. He's going to die on that cross, and just like he, they pulled that rib out of Adam, where did they, where, where did they take that spear and pl- plunge it into Jesus? Huh? Right. We came out of Jesus. That's where we came. We don't get this privilege if it isn't for him. Amen? Amen? Yeah. Okay, okay. Y'all, y'all with me here? What was the purpose? Why was Eve created? 
create sons of God. You want to know why? Because what's the purpose of the church? Ephesians 3.21. To bring glory to God. And you want to know what sons of God do? They glorify God. It's almost like God done wrote the book. It's almost like God instituted this stuff. Oh, he did. And he takes this stuff very, very seriously. The purpose of God creating marriage, man and a woman, was not so that we can enjoy one another and she brings me joy and happiness. No, the purpose of marriage is so that the woman would come under and submit commission under the covenant with her husband so that they too can join together as one to complete the mission. That's the purpose of marriage. And boy, what I tell you, most marriage problems would go away if we got that. If we understood what the actual purpose of it is. Hey, I can't speak for the lost world. But I can speak to people who claim to be Christians. Hey, this is your purpose. This is your mission. The purpose God, uh, of God creating marriage of man and woman is so that we can live out the mystery. Are you sure about that, Pastor? Yeah, that's exactly what it says in this passage. That's exactly what it says. It's so that we can live out the mystery. It will be the greatest practical lesson of life in Christ you will ever have. So how about that for a statement? How about that for a statement? Huh? That's coming from your pastor. I'm telling you right now, the greatest practical life of your Christian life you will ever have will be taught through your marriage. You can't get any more practical than that. They go, I'm not married. Yeah, but you're married to the church. So everything that applies in a marriage applies to you and your relationship to your church. How you would treat Someone within a marriage is how you should treat your church. So you want to know why a lot of people leave churches and do what they do? And they, you know, okay, in a marriage, would it be okay? Would it be okay if I said, you know what, Sarah, man, I'm not feeling you today, man. I'm going to go hang out with another girl. I'm going to go try another girl this Sunday. See how that works out. Would that be okay in a marriage? Well, then it's not okay in the church either. It's very simple. If you wouldn't do it, or if it's not right in a marriage, then it's not right in the church either. Matter of fact, I would argue, there's your very lesson. You want to get practical, man. You can't get any more practical and any more simple than that. We were talking last night at our Bible study about how when you, uh, 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 we were talking about apologetics, right? And we were talking about how uh, when you uh, preach the gospel to somebody, when you preach the gospel to somebody, you know, you can't get into an intellectual debate with them over whether God created the universe or not, or however, all those things, you ain't going to get anywhere with that. What, because we're not on even ground. Someone's going to think this, someone's going to think this. You never, what you need to do is get them onto even ground, and that even ground is morality. We, we, it doesn't matter who you're talking to, whether you're a pygmy in Africa or whether you're the guy down the street. Murder is not good. No one's going to go, I love murder. Murder is great. I, I vouch for it. Let's go. No. We're gonna, you see what I'm saying? Okay? It's the same thing here, guys. If you're going to relate your practical living in, in your Christian life, man, I can sit up here and I can give you practical understanding of Scripture all day long. Robert can do it. And I'm not saying we won't or we shouldn't and that's not good. What I am telling you, though, you'll never get more practical living in your Christian life than just to look at the situation and go, well, would that be okay in a marriage? Nope. Then it ain't okay in the church either. I mean, it's, it's so simple, it's stupid. But yet, somehow, somewhere along the line, we treat church not like we would treat our wives. Yet, some do, don't they? Some do, don't they? And how does that end up? How does that end up? Listen, number one, Christ teaches us how to change your heart's purpose. This is exactly what is needed for marriages, churches, countries, and our, uh, uh, our very existence. If we would understand what our purpose is, everything else would fall into place. The problem is, we don't understand it. 
God's grace working in people working together. Because if you got a husband and wife, what were they supposed to create? So what do you have? Little kids start popping out. What is that little institution called now? A family. It's almost like God done created this thing. Because he did. And what do you think Satan is attacking? He ain't attacking churches. That's, that's garbage. He don't need to. We're too dumb to get it. No, he's attacking families. Because he, under, he understands what the family unit represents. He understands the similitude. And so that's where he spends his time. He, he spends his time attacking family. And he's doing a great job of it because we're letting him. You cannot make anyone, including your spouse, do anything. And by the way, God does not want to make you do it either. There's so much that can be taught in the realm of, of, of uh, uh, the, the, the church. And so what I want to spend a couple minutes here talking about, because this is going to transition into what I want to talk to you about. Okay, so I know it's 1140. You're going to go, oh, you said you're stopping at 1140. This is transitioning into what I want to end with. Okay, everybody here is, 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 is uh, uh, I, I think, considers themselves members of this church. I don't see anybody in here that doesn't, so I don't need to stop. I'm just going to go unless we can get out of here, okay? So I'm just going to transition nice and easy. It's 1141. I usually go to 1215. I will go to 1215. We'll be done. We can go home. Everyone can be happy because I got tortellini in the thing, and I want to eat some of it because it sounds good. All right, listen. Listen, let me give you some examples here. People get so upset uh, uh, with me because uh, 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 I try to raise the bar in this church, right? I push, sometimes maybe too hard, that which I know are important issues, that for whatever reason,